The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, I hope that all of us can feel that way. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That phrase comes from Nehemiah chapter 8, I believe about verse 10, where Nehemiah has uh, returned and he leads a physical reconstruction of Jerusalem while the prophet Ezra leads a spiritual reconstruction. And he tells the weeping people who are so moved by the opening of the book of the law uh, not to weep, to, to go and be joyful, uh, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say it with me, Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Remember Hebrews three thirteen. exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we're giving ourselves a spiritual checkup, and while we've talked about faith, hope, and love, today we want to talk about joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Where's your joy? What is joy? Well, first of all, I'd like for you to uh, think about it uh, from the scriptures, the way it's used, and uh, kind of have in your mind where we get this idea of joy and uh, I want to start by looking at Acts 20 and verse 24, um, not so much for its uh, teaching in regard to joy, but to demonstrate to you um, what this word means. And so if, if we look at Acts 20 and uh, verse 24, um, notice with me uh, where Paul says, uh, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. Now, here's the word joy. Of course, the uh, New Testament was written in Greek, and so the original Greek word that's translated into English as joy here is the word, uh, it would be, we would pronounce it kara, uh, or something similar to that. And you can see it means cheerfulness, uh, delight. And in the authorized version, which is the King James Version of 1611, um, it's translated 51 times in the New Testament as joy. And uh, then just a, a handful of times, gladness, joyful, joyous, that kind of thing. Now, remember, that is the word kara. That's the word we're looking at. But what I want you to notice is also, uh, he says, I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I want to bring your attention to the word grace because that in Greek is the word charis. You can see they pretty much have the same root with just a different ending, and that word is grace, graciousness. Uh, and uh, you can see that it means a favor, a gift, a benefit. And so in the authorized version, it's translated grace 156 times, or pardon me, 130 times of the 156 that it's used. So that's the general meaning of the word grace. So the reason I wanted to bring that up is to show you that um, that grace and joy uh, come from the same root, which I assume tells us that they are interrelated. So maybe we should think of uh, joy, kara, 
as understanding and, and then our response to the grace of God. It's a, a delightful response because we know we've been saved in Jesus. Well, let's look at how important joy is. Uh, for example, in uh, Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, uh, we're going to notice there uh, the beginning of the importance of joy. And so um, just taking a look there, and this uh, 14th chapter of Romans uh, is about, uh, you know, not putting your scruple, your, your feelings ahead of another's scruples. Uh, so you don't do something that you know to be right when someone else has doubts about it and you, you wound their conscience and that kind of thing. So he says uh, in, uh, in verse 15, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. So he's talking here about someone who has a conscience. They're not supposed to eat meat. They only eat vegetables, that kind of thing. Don't you, because you're convinced that it's okay to eat meat, uh, destroy that one, you know, wound his conscience. He says in verse 16, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. But notice verse 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So the kingdom of God is all about joy. And so we're not supposed to do those things that would take away the joy of another. And knowing that we are working with each other to produce these good actions toward God, that should bring joy in and of itself. Now, Peter talks about how joy can transcend uh, even the problems of this life, and that's, that's something that I have to remind myself of many times, and that is that joy and peace, uh, those things don't come just because there is the absence of, of trouble and problems, but they come in spite of those things when we are in Christ, joy and peace. So think with me about 1 Peter 1 and verses 6 through 9. Now, I want to remind you that in the previous verses, verses 3 through 5, Peter has said that uh, we're born again. God's provided uh, through the resurrection of Jesus a living hope for us that there is an inheritance in heaven for us, and, and we are kept through, the, through faith uh, for that inheritance, and all of that brings joy to us. So he says in verse 6, in this, in this hope, in this being born again, in this inheritance, he says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." So notice here, uh, these are people that are going through trials. Uh, they're going through uh, having troubles in this life, and yet they're able to rejoice and have joy. Why? Because of all the things that the Lord has done for us transcend those things, and we can rejoice even in the midst of trials. Uh, the Hebrew writer uh, also talks about this in um, Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, I want you to notice in Hebrews 10, uh, verses 32 through 34, and see again how not only can we have joy when things are going good, but even in the midst of terrible trials. So he says there, Recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted 
the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. How do you keep your joy when someone is plundering your goods by knowing that uh, what they have taken is not your eternal goods, that you've been laying up treasures in heaven. So even in losses in this life, the Lord has given us a way to be joyful and maintain our joy even in the worst of circumstances. And it, it seems like the absence of joy in the life of the Christian may be the most outwardly visible sign. You know, we, we may be struggling with our love or struggling with our hope. Uh, those things may not be readily apparent to people around us, but when we lose our joy, uh, that is very apparent. And, and for some more than others, I've been told that I wear my feelings on my shirt sleeve, and, and uh, a, lot, a lot of people can tell if there's the slightest thing off with me. Not everybody's like that. Some people hide things really well. But regardless of whether we can, uh, whether we express that or not, uh, many times uh, the absence of joy becomes very visible to those around us. When we become depressed, when we become uh, uh, sad, when we feel like we are defeated, that's an uh, those are obvious symptoms of losing our joy. Well, if my joy is not where it's supposed to be, where God wants it to be, what are some things I can do in my spiritual checkup to get that joy back where it needs to be? Both Jesus and his apostles address this and give us remedies for a lack of joy. Uh, In John chapter 15, in verse 11, I want you to notice there uh, what Jesus says, first of all, Uh, about this and helping us in this. And uh, notice with me, first of all, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now listen to Jesus. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus spoke these things so that they could ponder them, treasure them, and be joyful about them. So the word of God, the the word of the Son of God in this case, uh, treasured in the heart, brings joy, even in the midst of terrible trials. And uh, also in 1 John, as as you begin the the, the epistle of 1 John uh, 1, notice how that epistle begins. Um, I think it's important that we, that we read the first four verses there. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, Jesus, in other words. The life was manifested as, as we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. So again, Jesus' words, the apostles' words, are written to bring joy into our life, so we can Again, see the value of daily getting into God's Word. Uh, you, you don't have to read a book a day. It's important, though, that you read from the book every day. And so uh, that will bring joy to us. Uh, somebody uh, had has reminded me that, you know, there's so much turmoil going on right now regarding the upcoming election for president. And, you know, people... Republicans think that the world is going to end if if Biden is elected president, and Democrats just know that the world's going to end uh, if Trump is reelected. Let's be reminded of something right now. After the election for president is over in November, God will still be on his throne. Jesus will still be King of kings and Lord of lords. 
The Bible will still have the answers to every problem. The tomb of Jesus will still be empty. Jesus will be the only way to heaven. Prayer will still work. The cross, not the government, will still be our salvation. There will still be room at the cross for you. Jesus will still save anyone who places their faith and trust in him in obedience. And God will still be with us always. He will never leave us or forsake us. Now, folks, all of those things I just listed, they're not going to change one iota regardless of who is elected president. Now, that should, that should bring joy to our lives. Remember that when things begin to get to you, when you start seeing yourself depressed, defeated, or sad, and retain that joy. And one final verse, John 16, and verse uh, 22 beginning, I want you to notice there with me the words of Jesus as we bring this to a close. Therefore, you now have sorrow. He's been talking about going away. He's about to ascend back to heaven. He says, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Things were about to change for them. Jesus was going away, and when they addressed the Father from now on, they would address him in the name of Jesus, and that would give them joy. And, and, and the knowledge that what they ask of God, God was ready to give to them, would bring joy. Folks, that hasn't changed a bit for us today. Our joy should be overflowing if we're Christians. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, we ask you, to let your joy be our strength today. Uh, Let us not get so caught up in the things of this world that we fail to remember our treasures are in heaven where you are, where your Son is seated next to you, where the Holy Spirit is doing incredible work in the lives of men and women uh, here on this earth, where the angels exist and where we long to be. Help us to remember this today, Father. Help us to have a smile on our face and warmth in our hearts as we go about this, the chores of the day. And may others ask us, what is this joy that you have? And we be ready to talk to them about you and your Son and the work of the Spirit. Please forgive our sins and be with us today. May we be your joyful servants in Jesus' name. And amen. Hey, a lot of things tend to get us down. Don't let the devil take away your joy. You have a great day. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking my faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh yes, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength.